All right, turn to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. And I believe the Bible when it says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein. For the time is at hand. And so I'm not going to neglect to read these and offer that blessing promised for those that hear these same words. So we'll go through Revelation chapter 2 in its entirety again. Revelation chapter 2. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And unto the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works, and tribulation, and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you, I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. We're going to be focusing on Smyrna here in this study. And Smyrna in regard to their not fearing, but rather acting in faith. Fear not, but have faith. Fear not, but have faith. 
Verse 8 begins with the usual introduction unto the church of Smyrna, where Jesus says this. He says, And unto the angel in the church of Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. And he established this again in the first chapter as he begins. And throughout the book of Revelation, you're going to hear him referring to himself, Jesus Christ being, as the first and the last, he which was dead and is alive. And I don't think this repetition is just in vain. It's there to remind us of the very nature of God, who he is and what he is and what he says he is. And we're to take note of these things. When he says that he is the first of the last, not only is referring to the fact that he, he spans time, in other words, he was there at the first and he was there at the last, but he's essentially saying he is the first and the last, so he is both at the same time. This is saying that he is beyond our rational understanding of time, first and last, because we know that those can never be joined. Those are, the same, those are not the same thing. One is far away from the other. So God is breaking outside of our own rationale and saying he is both the first and he is also the last. He is outside then of our own understanding of time and how it applies to us. He is the beginning and the end. He is the first and the last. And this is a very important characteristic of God because that essentially in enables us to understand that he doesn't have an end and he also doesn't have a beginning, but that he is, he is both in our own framework and understanding of this very concept. He says that, and, and what we must do then, since we don't have any, side, any way of rationalizing these types of ideas, we must know God directly through the vehicle of our faith. Yes, Many went with Jesus, walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, and so they could have a tangible evidence of who he was. But maybe when he said things like, I'm the first, I'm the last, I'm the Alpha and Omega, it might have been confusing to them even. So even though they were able to tangibly touch and talk and work with and walk with Jesus Christ at a time, in that aspect of him they didn't need faith to believe. They still needed faith to understand how he could be the first and the last. So then we must know, everybody must know God through this same vehicle of faith. It says in Hebrews in that famous faith chapter that he that cometh to God must believe that he is, right? And that he is a warder of them that diligently seek him. So we must first believe that he is. Well, what is he? He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning of the end. He is the way, the truth, the life. He's the door. He is the bread. He is the water of life. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the Son of God. All of these things, when we come to God, we must believe that he is these things. Just yesterday, we encountered somebody that was just hung up of Islamic descent on the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. But if you don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, then you cannot have salvation that's offered through him. You must believe that he is. Well, what is he? He's all the things that he says he is. Not saying that when you give a gospel presentation to him, they must believe all of the concepts that are given and all the things he said. It would take hours to expound unto them all the many names of Jesus contained within the scriptures. But when they hear them later, they shouldn't have an affront to it. And something like the name of the Son of God automatically must be accepted upon the time of salvation because that in and of itself gives you a picture of the Trinity. Uh, Brother Samson and I were talking about that, how, how believing that Jesus is the Son of God breaks apart the Muslim faith because they believe in one God, but automatically pointing out the fact that Jesus is the Son of God and God puts the fact that there is a Father, there is a Son. Understandably, not everybody understands the concept of the Holy Spirit, and that poor Spirit of God often gets neglected in the, in the conversation. That's why people go into great detail in, in doctrine of the Holy Spirit, and it's actually a, a meaty doctrine. It's something that, that takes a lot for us to understand. But the good news is, is that when you understand the Father, you understand the Son, you understand that at least that the Spirit exists, as soon as you believe on the name of the Son of God, it, what happens is the Spirit of God enters into you. And now he's going to begin to teach you about himself. So the Spirit of God, while he's not often right away understood, has an interesting and wonderful ministry where he can enter into a believer and then start from that fertile ground to expound unto them all of the things that Christ said about the Spirit of God himself. But... You must believe that he is. And we need to come with that same vehicle of faith in our understanding of God, especially in the things that are difficult to comprehend from a rational way of thinking. Go to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. I love the phrase where he says, he was dead and is alive. He was dead and is alive. This is talking about how essentially Jesus Christ died. 
And he was buried, and he rose again the third day. He was dead, but now he is alive. And this is great news for us because we all have loved ones, perhaps, believers that have passed away, that they are dead, but they shall be alive again. And that's why we don't sorrow as them that have no hope. Because Christ offers the resurrection of life, saying that he himself is the resurrection and the life. And if we grab a hold of that, then we need not fear, though we see our loved ones as deceased, though we see people, uh, believers of, of yesteryear as deceased at this time. We need not to mourn as others that have no hope, because Christ himself is the resurrection and the life. And this is a portion of scriptures, the death of Lazarus, where Jesus really grabs hold of this opportunity to teach people about himself in regard to the resurrection. Look with me in John chapter 11 and verse 14. Then Jesus, then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And so there's a whole build up into this where they found out that he was sick. And so they came, they, they, they started to make their way over to see Lazarus. Jesus seemed to be kind of taking his time. Um, as you read this, you see that Jesus doesn't just rush there, that he takes his time. He takes breaks. He stops in other places. He's not in a hurry to get to Lazarus. Uh, he says that he sleepeth, and the disciples are like, well, if he taketh rest, he doeth well. In other words, he's going to get rest. He's going to get strengthened. That's going to be a good thing. But plainly, he says, Lazarus is dead here in verse 14, taking away from their flesh basically the wind right out of them. They had hoped that Lazarus was just sick and that he would recover and that he would be stronger for the rest, for the sleep that he had taken. But no, Jesus takes the wind right out of their flesh when he says, Lazarus is dead. He says it very plainly and very pointedly. And in verse 15, there was a purpose to all this. He needed us to lose our trust in the flesh that he would be sustained, that Lazarus would be stained, sustained on the power of his own flesh getting rest. And he needed to transition them to an understanding that now you need faith in order to sustain, in order to step into this atmosphere, in order to step into this situation. Jesus says in verse 15, and I'm glad. Lazarus is dead and I am glad. That's a, an interesting way to jump into the next phrase, the next verse. I am glad for whose sake? For your sake that I was not there. To the intent ye may believe, nevertheless let us go on to them. So he's glad that Jesus himself, he's glad that he wasn't there to do anything about this situation, but rather for their sakes that they might believe, Jesus is now preparing himself to go unto him after the fact. This opened up a situation that was very bleak and very grim, as is said by Thomas in verse 16, which is called Didymus unto his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. He's just given up all hope in this situation. He's like, he's like, what in the world? Something could have been done about this. We've seen Jesus heal. We've seen Jesus heal. We all have the faith to believe that Christ could have stepped in and solved this sickness that, G that Lazarus was experienced. And so the grim situation enters in them where Thomas, which is called Didymus, says, let us go also that we may die with him. We've lost all hope in this situation. Verse 21, though, I'll continue down, uh, begins as Martha enters the story. That said Martha um, unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. So again, all of them knew well enough that if Christ had been there, if he hadn't, as it seems, taken his time to get to the situation, he would have done something, and the brother of Martha here, Lazarus, would not have been dead. Lord, if you were here you would have stopped this pain from coming upon us. You would have stopped this sickness from taking our brother. You would have helped so that all of these people weren't mourning and weeping and in this grim and dire situation. Here, though, she gives and offers a little bit of faith in the understanding. She says, Jesus, if you were here, this wouldn't have happened. And in verse 22, she said, but I know that even now, even after the death, even after he has been put in the grave, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. So she extends the fact and understands the fact that Jesus has this one-to-one -one with God. Jesus is God. Jesus has the God's God the Father's ear, and can do whatever he will through the vehicle of prayer unto him. Whatever he asks the Father, he will do it. Verse 24, verse 23 rather, Jesus saith unto her, thy brother shall rise again. Thy brother shall rise again. And she's like, okay, of course. 
Of course my brother shall rise again. She answers with almost a sigh here as he says, Thy brother shall rise again. In verse 24, Martha saith unto him, I know, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus, I know that in that time to come, in, in that far away time, that he shall rise again in the resurrection. She's got faith enough to believe this, but she doesn't have faith in the present. She doesn't have faith to get through what she is experiencing, what she is living right now. She almost here answers with a sigh, yes, I know. My, my faith is good enough to understand Jesus. I understand that you will raise him up at the last day as you have promised oh so many times. And Martha says this almost with a sigh you can hear in the verse. But then Jesus, again, remember, he's glad that all this happened. He, he, he rejoices in the fact that now these might be able to believe something that he's trying to teach them. Though they just witnessed their brother, though they just witnessed their friend, though they just witnessed their son or their father or whatever Lazarus was unto them, pass away. And many people know them. The Bible says that men came from far and wide, all to descend upon this town to mourn. Whatsoever Lazarus was, they had saw him die. They had saw him buried. They saw him with a stone rolled over top of him. And Jesus says, he is dead nevertheless. I'm glad. Why? Because he's going to teach them something here in verse 25. Jesus saith unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. So she says the resurrection is going to come in a faraway place. It's going to come at that last day. But Jesus just pointed out, no, -uh, the resurrection is here. The resurrection just showed up on your doorstep. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. This is the story. This is the truth that Jesus is bringing out of the real life parable that they had just witnessed before them. Quite often we'll hear parables given about situations in order that a spiritual truth might be highlighted. But the resurrection here seems to be important enough that Jesus didn't want to just use a parable to get through. No, but he was glad rather to see Lazarus put into a grave in order that he would expound unto them the great truth of the fact that the resurrection is not just the last day, but the resurrection is today and just showed up. I am the resurrection and the life. And he says, he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And he asked her this question, believest thou this? Believest thou this? I understand that you believe that he'll be raised up at the last day. I understand that you believe that if I was here, I could have stopped what happened from happening. But do you believe that I am he? Do you believe that I am the resurrection and I am the life? And here's the two statements that Jesus brings up. He said, are you dead? Well, you shall live. Do you live and believe? No, you shall never die. And here, this Lazarus experience, the world saw that he tasted death. The world saw that he died, but what they didn't see was the truth of the fact is that Lazarus was a believer on Christ just in as much as any of us in this room would be. And so what happened was, as Jesus said, he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Well, what happened? He was dead in trespasses and sins, but he's alive through faith in Jesus Christ. And then he says this, and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die, right? Lazarus had already taken care of the first part. He was dead, yet shall he live because he had believed in Jesus Christ. If he was believed in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. He was dead in trespasses, and this carries on. But Lazarus here experienced himself the second portion of this statement in verse 26. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Lazarus didn't die from Lazarus' point of view. Lazarus woke up in Abraham's bosom, per se. He woke up with, with the saints on high. He woke up instantaneously after closing his breath here. Instantly, the, the Bible says that if you believe in him, who sort of lives and believes, shall never die. Amen. So the world looks and says, my brother's dead, my brother's dead, my brother's dead. Jesus, if you were here, my brother wouldn't be dead. And Jesus is saying, hey, your brother believed in me. He was dead, yet shall he live. And because he lives and believes, he shall never die. Your brother isn't dead. I am the resurrection and the life. This is what he's highlighting. Believest thou this. Believest thou this. This is a little bit complicated, perhaps, of a thing, but you just need to understand that there's two perspectives happening. Lazarus, from his perspective, he never died. 
<laughs> From the spiritual realm, he never died. Everyone else looking upon the situation witnessed it and said, okay, well, he's obviously dead. He's been put in the grave. The stone's been rolled over. It's been three or four days. He stinketh by now. His flesh is rotting. But here, the physical representation offered then the spiritual truth where Jesus could step in and explain to them a very real, understandable truth that what Lazarus was experiencing was not the same as what they were experiencing. And he was just going to use that situation as an example, and eventually he would just turn it all on its head and again prove that he has the power not only to resurrect at the last day, but he has the power to resurrect now. Not only that, but he has the power to just allow that no one would even need a resurrection. Why? Because he didn't get put in the grave, Lazarus didn't. He didn't get thrown into the dirt. He didn't experience death. He was already alive with God. He was already absent from the body and immediately present with the Lord. Understandably, the last day has a resurrection. That's when they'll be reunited with their resurrected flesh. But as far as the comprehension of the soul that is saved, that is in Christ, as soon as they leave this earth, absent from the body, they're immediately present with the Lord. Amen. And so he highlights this truth. And both of these truths are something that need to be grabbed hold of by faith. And back in Revelation chapter 2, I believe he uses this exact phraseology to give them that same hope. These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Because Jesus was dead and is alive, these that he's talking to, if they believe in him, shall never die. They shall never, ever, 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 ever taste of death. For Christ tasted death for them. But they need to believe this by faith, just as Mary and Martha and, and the others that had joined themselves to that caravan of mourners needed to understand that Point one was he is dead, yet shall he live. That's the spiritual salvation when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to the saving of your soul. That can't be seen by any man. No one's going to look on you and just know, hey, that man is born again. Rather, they're just going to see you as dead. They're going to see you just like they see everybody else. You might have some changes. You might clean yourself up a little bit, but you're in the same flesh that is dead. It just stinks. It's rotten. Everybody that looks upon you will just think you're another dead man. Why? Because it's your spirit that's been alive and crazy. Quickened. So again, like we said, you cannot see on the outward plane somebody that is dead yet shall live, yet does live. And the other point, point number two, is he that liveth and believeth shall never die. No one else sees that either. When somebody passes away and their flesh hits the ground, they don't see that. As soon as that spirit is departed from the body, it's immediately present with the Lord. They just look down and say, Josh is dead. They don't know the truth that Josh is not dead because Josh will never die because he's believed on Christ to the saving of your soul. Both of these truths are flesh truths. The salvation of your soul plus the immediate ascension unto God when you leave your present body. Those need to be accepted by faith. And these two things are, are positions that you need to constantly and repeatedly just affirm yourself in them because they will really help you in your general Christian life. If you believe that you are saved and you shall, even though you were dead, yet shall you live, that is the springboard where your salvation starts. And your life after that can be so much better if you realize that your flesh is dead. Your flesh is dead. You don't have to satisfy a dead flesh anymore. You can gratify and move in and grow in the living spirit. But you have to accept by faith again that your flesh is dead. Now you live and you believe. You will never die. But we don't experience that. We don't know that. But we need to understand and reckon and believe and, and receive and, and affirm ourselves in that same truth that when we pass away, we'll instantly be with God. It puts things into perspective when we're living in this present flesh and in this present evil world that there is a hope to come. There is something beyond this that is so much greater. And when we have the right perspective on that, it makes it a lot easier to live in the present world that we are in. And Jesus, I believe, brought these up personally purposely, on purpose, because he's trying to then encourage this Smyrna church to not fear, but rather live in faith. Live in the faith that I am he which was dead and yet alive. I am he which is the first and last. I have power over all of these things. I was dead, I am alive. Therefore, you don't have to ever taste of death. But from that position where if you're dead, you shall live. If you're living and you're breathing, you shall never die. Here comes the introduction, which is directly applied to the state of this Smyrna church. 
as a whole. In verse 9, you'll start to read, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but this statement, but thou art rich. And immediately this kind of confused me. I was, I was like, what is this statement? If they're poor, how can they also be rich? And you're going to see an order of things and how it plays out. It says, I know, in Revelation 2 and verse 9, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty. And this is the order of things, honestly. If you're a believer, if you've trusted in the Christ that is was dead and is alive, the first and the last, if you believed on him and trust him, you'll have some works. They may, you may fight them, you may kick against them, you may struggle against them, but if you get on board with Christ's program and you have some works as this church had, do you know what follows the works? Tribulation. Do you know what follows the tribulation? Quite often poverty. Because this is what happens is somebody starts to do Christian works, then tribulation comes in from their parents or from their family or from their, their job opportunity, from whatever, and the eventual end is great poverty. And this is what the Smyrna uh, angel experienced. This is what the Smyrna church experienced as a whole. They started working. Tribulation set in and great poverty came, but thou art rich. And I think that's what, it, what that ex explaining is the fact. I learned a little bit about the history of the whole thing. Is that, is that Ephesus and Smyrna and per, per, Pergamum, were, were, were three coastal cities at this time. And each one of them being coastal cities were very affluent in trade. They ended up bringing great big bricks and blocks and, and, and built great uh, cathedrals and towers. There was, a, there was apparently a huge, in uh, Smyrna, um, uh, like an Olympic-sized stadium where they would hold those games and sort of things. It was actually one where many Christians were murdered in. But... You'll see that there was a great wealth in there, and that's going to happen anytime in the old days when there's a city that is built upon the waters. Why? Because they're the ones where all the trade goes through, and when they bring the trade items in, they're the ones that taxes them before they send them out to the rest of the world. They become very rich because they're in a, a position where they can gain great wealth. And so that city as a whole, the city of Smyrna, and maybe even some that we're, we're believers now who are impoverished, were very wealthy. So this is what happens. You're, you're a rich, wealthy, doing well you know, person, a Gentile within the nation of Smyrna, within the city of Smyrna. Suddenly you're a believer. Suddenly you start getting works. What happens after works? Tribulation. Maybe he loses his job. Maybe he loses his customers. Maybe he loses his family. And then he comes in his poverty state to join amongst the church. And therefore his works turned into tribulation and turned into poverty. And this is what you'll see. So they're poor but thou art rich. They could be rich, but everything that wealth had or, or was or, or had been was now gone from them. We experience a similar thing. Among a rich nation, a church can be brought to great ruin from a worldly standpoint. There are all sorts of things that a government can do to ruin a church. You're seeing that happening in China all the time. They're making those churches go underground. They, they become very impoverished. People that are believers lose their job. All sorts of things happen from the tribulation standpoint. And what results is great poverty, though the nation at whole may be rich. James chapter 2 talks about this. James chapter 2. Keep your finger in Revelation 2. And we'll go to James chapter 2. <clears throat> Another area where they were rich, not necessarily in affluence, worldly speaking, maybe they were rich and they lost everything when they became a believer and they started the works and tribulation entered in. But the Bible in James chapter 2 talks about those that are rich in faith. Look at verse 5. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him. Those that love him are those that are doing the works. That would be indicative and representative of the church at Smyrna. They had done works because if you love me, you keep my commandments, and keeping the commandments is works. Amen. So, hath not God chosen then the poor to be rich in the world? So that's the other aspect of how they're impoverished, though they are rich. How easy is it for us to go into the uh, areas of this city and preach the gospel unto those that are very poor and we can see great results and many saved. Those that are poor in this world are rich in faith. It's easy for them to believe. It's easy for them to receive a free gift because they love free things because they can't afford nothing that isn't free, right? But when we go into the rich areas, it's completely contrary. It's completely different. They don't receive it the same. So the poor then become the ones that join up with the church, have the works, and receive the tribulation. The poor in this world are rich in faith. 
In verse 6 it says, but ye have despised the poor. So this is just a lesson in the context of James chapter 2 as a whole. But by principle, I want to grab a hold of what it says next. It says, do not rich men oppress you and draw you before judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which you are called? So here, the believers were rich in faith. They were, they were poor in monetary. But here, he is saying that because they are rich in faith, you have the rich men oppressing you in your poor monetary state. They draw them before judgment seats. They blaspheme that worthy name by which they are called. And this is the exact same thing that was experienced in Revelation chapter 2. The oppression, the judgment, the blasphemy, all copied, all aligned perfectly with what's being talked about in James chapter 3. Perhaps James was in that area. I have no idea. Or he just experienced um, the same type of thing that happens. Because I think this is just a general principle that will apply to many Christians. Back in Revelation chapter 2, you see that the oppression was that the rich in spirit were made poor carnally. They were brought to judgment. Well, isn't that what it says in Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 9? It says, I know the blasphemy of them. No, verse 10, sorry. It says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that ye may be tried. And this could be a trial of their faith, but it's also just a trial of the fact that they will be judged because they are believers and, and receive the condemnation of the same. The blasphemy. Here, the blasphemy is recorded of those that say they are Jews. And so James chapter 2 syncs up really nicely with Revelation chapter 2 and, this, and the explanation that Smyrna has. You can go back and forth later and, and get a little bit more from this, I'm sure. But those that say they are Jews and regarding them... Many will say, according to their understanding, and it's usually a dispensational idea, that after Revelation chapter 3, there is no such thing as the church. That's why the church is raptured up in Revelation chapter 4. Why? Because they never see that term church mentioned. But what you do see, and, and never mind this, you'll see saints, you'll see the woman and her seed, you'll see the souls that were slain for the word of God. So of course, those would all be parts of the church. But they ignore those references. Just because church isn't mentioned, it means that the church is gone by Revelation chapter 4. But if you take that same logic and apply it to these Jews that are blaspheming, you'll find there's two references to the Jews in the same context, and that also ends in Revelation chapter 3. The Jews here are mentioned, and they're mentioned in a very derogatory context. Here, they are always those, and there's two examples. There's the one that we just read in chapter 2 and verse 9. There's the other one in chapter 3 and verse 9. It says, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. So the context of Jews here is those that say they are, but are not, but are instead of a synagogue of Satan. So this is a group that is speaking very ill of. And again, you don't hear of them after Revelation chapter 3. But the church is speaking very highly of, and you don't hear about them after Revelation chapter 3. So who's going to grab hold of this and just say, well, then the church doesn't exist, and the Bible after that is written solely for the Jews? No, I don't believe that for a second. I believe that they've just kind of given them a different context in which they can explain the two as a whole. But the Bible here records the Jew very poorly, especially in Jesus' day, where the Jews were the religion of the Pharisees. They were the leaders at the time. They were the ones that were constantly persecuting him. In Paul's day, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Bible records of the Jews, 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 14, For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God which are in Judea, in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men, for ridding us to speak to the Gentiles, that they might be saved, to fill their sin always. For the wrath is come upon them unto the uttermost. Here again, in Paul's day, as in Jesus' day, what is known as Jews is, is a, a negative connotation. Here in, is they're blasphemers. They're persecuting of believers. They're restricting that the gospel would even be preached. And this is exactly what the 
people, the church, the believers in Smyrna face, the synagogue of Satan coming at them as they did in Christ's day to trip them up and to mess them up and to, 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 to find ways of accusing them, to cast them into prison and to judge them. As it said in Thessalonians that they killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, but now they're persecuting the church and they're pleasing not God. They're contrary to all men. And this is just a general theme that you'll find in regard to the church, no, no, regard to the Jews against the church. They're liars, and forgive me for believing the Bible, but this is exactly what it says. Those that say they are Jews but are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan, those are the ones that from Matthew unto the end are the most wicked and heinous and troublesome against the cause of Christ. By the way, just in case anybody's going to get upset with me, Jew is a religion. It's not a race. I'm not a racist person, but the Jewish religion as a whole is the one that is constantly in the front to God, constantly pleasing not God, constantly fighting against God. And as you read it through the Acts, it's not the Gentile that are coming after them. It's not the average individual. It's the religious Jews that are constantly persecuting the church, constantly coming after the Christians, constantly trying to destroy the work and the word of God from going forward. These here are the hypocrisy, the hypocritical Jews. There obviously is a true Jew when the Bible here records they say they are Jews but are not. And then a later date we'll discuss who the true Jew is. But here they are those that are saying they are something that they are not. Here they're oppressing. And they're oppressing to such an intense point that the Bible, through the words of Jesus Christ, through the messenger that came, felt it needful to point out that Jesus is the one that was dead and is alive. And he does this to offer hope for the situation that they are facing. Verse 9, I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, back in Revelation 2, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. And verse 10, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. It's guaranteeing the suffering that's going to come by the hands of the synagogue of Satan. Behold, the devil and his synagogue shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto the death, and I will give thee the crown of life. So here the overbearing message that Christ is trying to portray to the church in Smyrna is, I am the resurrection and the life. You need to believe by faith those two truths that we highlighted. If you're dead, yet shall ye live, if you believe on Christ and trust him for your salvation. If you live and you believe, you shall never die. But here he's saying, be faithful unto the death. In other words, the world is going to see the church in Smyrna at large fall to the ground dead. Like I said, there was that big stadium there which was used. Um, Polycarp being a specific um, next in line to John, he learned from John as a, as a pastor and a bishop over the church in Smyrna was martyred in the very Colosseum where they would celebrate the sporting events ahead of time. And you can only assume that much of the church would have followed in that same steps. And so here John writes unto the angel of the church of Pergamos, being his immediate successor, which I believe may explain why there's some brevity in this, this thing. Because when I first looked at this passage of scripture, I found it really hard to grab something out of it because it was so short. There's only two verses referring to the exact things that they're going through. And it's nothing but persecution. But I think he was brief, the apostle John, because he had already had great at length discussions with Polycarp, his immediate disciple. But here he gives them two offerings of hope. He says, trust the fact that the rewards are coming. He said, and I will give thee a crown of life to those that are trip, go through tribulation and those that are faithful unto death. Look forward to the rewards, but also look forward to the resurrection. Here is a preview of everything that we need to trust and rely on. It comes from Revelation chapter 22. Do you ever go to the end of a book just to figure out how it ends? I love doing this. He says in Revelation 22 and verse 12, Behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give to every man according to his works shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, the first and the last. Christ giving that same assurance unto the church in Smyrna at this time. And he's saying, hey, don't fear the suffering. Don't fear your relationships falling into shambles. Don't fear the work place isn't going good and you're suffering persecution and trials of affliction. Don't fear when your family's attacking you, your friends are failing you, the world's failing you, the world's coming at you. When there's persecution, tribulation, even when you're tortured unto death, look to the resurrection and the life and the truths that he gave when he said that simple statement, I am dead 
and yet I'm alive. I'm dead, and yet I'm alive. He promised rewards, and he promised a resurrection. Though ye were dead, yet shall ye live. Do you live and do you believe today ye shall never die? And this is the message unto the church in Smyrna at large. You are going to be persecuted. You are going to suffer things. Be faithful unto death. And that's the direct message that he wanted to give to the angel of the church of Smyrna. By extension, the believer is there. But here it is again. Verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be heard of the second death. And there's that promise that though you will pass from death in this life, it's immediately absent from the body, present with the Lord. Look forward to what's promised by he which liveth and by he which was dead and is alive, look forward to the promises that he will give you rewards for the things that you suffer here, but also that he will ensure as an overcomer, as a believer, as trusting in him, that you shall not be hurt of the second death. This is for the church in Smyrna. This is also for those in this room under the sound of my voice that have an ear to hear.